Hello there, come on in. So when I was a kid uh, growing up in New York, if you wanted to distract somebody's attention, you would point over their shoulder and cry, look, Haley's Comet. I don't know why. I mean, I've never actually seen the thing. Although if you were around on May the 22nd in 760, you might have done, as this date is marked out as someone noting the 14th recorded perihelion passage of Haley's Comet. Perihelion, I mean, is that a most marvellous word? It comes from the Greek words peri, meaning near, and helios, meaning the Greek god of the sun. And thus, it means the point in the orbit of a planet, asteroid, or in this case, comet, that is nearest to the sun. Uh, so you can only see Halley's Comet uh, when this perihelion thing happens, uh, and that is every 75 years or so. It's the only comet of its kind which is regularly visible to the naked eye from Earth, and it last showed up for us in 1986. So you'll need to live to sometime in 2061 or 2062 to see it again. I'm going to be 104. One of the joys of the world temporarily coming to a standstill is that the air quality has dramatically improved. We breathe better and at night the stars shine more clearly. You wouldn't miss the comet if it came by. I know this, and yet I am ashamed to say one of the things I miss about being grounded is flying. I know it's environmentally unfriendly, but I do love being up among the clouds. It was on May 22nd, 1906, that the Wright brothers were granted US patent number 821393 for their flying machine. The person often left out of this well-known story is Susan Wright, the boy's mother. She was born in 1831 in Hillsborough, Virginia, and grew up to attend college, which I have to tell you was most unusual for a girl at the time. She loved science and maths. Susan gave birth to seven kids, but sadly only the brothers Wilbur and Orville survived. She was always making them things, including a sled, with which she is said to have taught them the basics about wind resistance. And when the boys had a mechanical problem with anything at all, it was their mother that they asked. Sadly, she died on July the 4th, 1889 of TB, and never lived to see them fly. But she was the mother of flight. Plenty of women have taken to the sky as aviators, or aviatrix, as women pilots used to be called. Uh, in 1935, Amelia Earhart became the first person, male or female, to fly solo the two and a half thousand miles across the Pacific Ocean from Hawaii to California. Now, I would have thought that this was a nerve-wracking enterprise, but Amelia was so relaxed during her 18 hours in the air that she had time to listen to some opera on the radio. And this diversion of hers links me to the first woman who ever took to the air. So, apart from Icarus's mythological flight, no human being had ascended freely into the skies until November the 21st, 1783. It was in the market square of Alnay, a small village in the Ardèche in France, that two brothers by the name of Montgolfier demonstrated the world's first practical hot air balloon. The idea for such an insane device is said to have come from women's dresses. Joseph Montgolfier had watched his wife airing her dresses in front of the fire, he noticed how the hot air currents made the dress material seem to balloon out and float. Perhaps heat, he thought, could also raise up some more substantial material. The Montgolfier's 500-pound balloon was made of sackcloth and paper and held together with 1,800 buttons. I once owned a very similar outfit myself. Uh, attempts to fly had been made a couple of times before, but these were with balloons tethered to the ground, uh, which carried non-human volunteers. Uh, in fact, a sheep called Montociel climbed to the sky, a duck and a rooster. But in 1793, the brothers' vast bag carried two male volunteers 6,000 feet into the air, unconnected to the earth, while a great cheer went up from a crowd of well-wishers. It would spark a balloon craze. Although I have to tell you, not everyone was thrilled. Uh, when Le Globe, uh, the first hydrogen-powered balloon, was sent up by French scientist Jacques Charles in the small town of Gonesse uh, in the same year in France, the people panicked. The thing fell from the sky and began fluttering about on the ground, at which point the locals attacked it with pitchforks before tying it to a horse's tail and dragging it through the streets. Just a few months later, it was time for the first woman to have a go. And here is the link to Amelia Earhart's flight. Madame Elizabeth Thibble of Lyon was an opera singer. On June the 4th, 1784, she and a Monsieur Florent left the French soil in a balloon called La Gustave in honour of King Gustav III of Sweden, who was having a weekend away with King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. You know, the way you do. Uh, and they all went to watch. Maybe having an opera singer in the basket was like icing 
on the cake. I can tell you that Elizabeth went all out for the occasion, dressed as the Roman goddess Minerva, in a lace-trimmed dress and a feathered hat. She took off singing two duets from Monsigny's La Belle Arsène, a popular opera of the time. Not content with hitting the high notes, it is recorded that she also kept the balloon in the air by feeding the vital firebox during the 45-minute flight. Sadly, I lack further information about her. I have seen her described as the esposée de la C, the abandoned spouse of a Lyon merchant, which is hardly how anybody wants to be remembered. How brave she must have been. Indeed, it uh, characterises all the early aviatrix. Perhaps my favourite of all the female pioneers of the sky is Bessie Coleman. Now, it's never good to begin a story at the end, but be warned, Bessie died because she was short, which is terrible. Uh, what is astonishing is that she was born poor and obscure, and by the time she died, from being short, uh, more than 10,000 people attended her funeral. Bessie was probably born on January the 26th, 1892 in Texas, but like other women in history, she also sometimes lied about her age. She was a marvellous mix of African-American on her mother's side and part Choctaw and Cherokee Indian on her father's. She grew up in Waxahachie, Texas. Uh, the family was large and poor, and Bessie walked four miles every day to a one-room school, dreaming, as she said, of amounting to something. In 1915, when she was 23, she moved to Chicago and got a job as a manicurist in the White Sox barbershop. Her brother John returned from the war in Europe and told her that French women were the best, that they were even allowed to fly aeroplanes. In that moment, Bessie decided to become a pilot. But no white instructor wanted to teach a black person and no black pilot wanted to teach a woman. She needed to go to France to learn, but as it would be a good idea to understand the lessons, she needed to learn French. Bessie went to language school and in November 1920 left for France ready to parler her way to becoming a pilot. The flying course at École d'Aviation des Frères Codon at Le Croteuil in the Somme took 10 months. Bessie did it in seven. She was now the world's first licensed African-American pilot, boy or girl. By the time she got back to America, she was quite the celebrity. She began giving demonstrations of daredevil manoeuvres. She even gave a show in Waxahachie, where she insisted that there was no segregation at the main gate. She became famous giving lectures in black theatres, churches and schools, but plenty of the white newspapers ignored her, and it was not always easy. Bessie could never quite afford the plane she wanted. On the evening of April the 30th, 1926, Bessie and her mechanic went up in her plane for a test run. She was planning a parachute jump for the next day. Bessie was too short to see over the edge of the cockpit, so she took off her seatbelt to lean over and check where she would land. Someone had left a wrench in the plane after it had been serviced. The stray tool slid into the gearbox and jammed. The plane failed to pull out of a dive. It spun, and aged just 34, Bessie was thrown out to her death. Ten thousand people paid their last respects at the memorial service in Chicago. It would be another 73 years before Bessie was inducted into the Texas Aviation Hall of Fame. Fabulous women. Oh, and who taught Amelia to fly? A woman called Netta Snook, born in 1896. Check her out. I know I shouldn't fly because it damages the planet, so instead I look at the art of the brilliant American artist Georgia O'Keeffe. She took to travelling the world in her 70s, her view of the planet from the seat of a plane changed her work forever. Her phenomenal paintings of the sky viewed from just above the clouds are another way to soar. Anyway, I can't go to plane, so I have persuaded uh, Debbie uh, to play at aeroplanes. Uh, so, uh, well, peanuts, please. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I'll have a vodka and tonic, please. So, thank you very much. Sorry. How much? I, I thought... I thought drinks were free in first class. What? This isn't first class? But I've been sitting here for months. No, I can't move now. We're just about to take off. Take care. Be kind. Vox Talks is now available in podcast form. Check the description below for links to listen and subscribe.